Thank you for joining us on this second event to meet Mentors Foundation Entrepreneur to be in our portfolio a business has to meet lots of social economic and environmental factors and Rachel Fowler and Tone Lay do not disappoint. Um, on April Fool's Day three years ago Rachel won our first annual undreamed of award which came with a cash prize of five thousand dollars offered by the anonymous donors who came up with the idea for the award um, totally won because not only because it meets our standards but because it challenges an entire industry to do things differently tone lay is a lot like the untours foundation small but mighty so I'm glad you're here to meet Rachel. In honor of this occasion, I'm wearing one of my many articles of Tone Lake clothing. This was Rachel's top as a fundraiser Ooh. plant trees in Cambodia. Um, and uh, we'll hear from Rachel. She's going to share her story and the story of Tone Lake, and then we'll open up the conversation after that. So Rachel, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you, Elizabeth, and all of the supporters of the Entourage Foundation. I think um, as a funding group, you are very values aligned with what we do. Um, and there are so many investors who haven't quite got there yet. So I really admire you and really appreciate all the ways that you're thinking about investing and um, co-creating better versions of the future. Um, with your entrepreneurial portfolio. Um, so I always am an admirer and a big fan of everything you do too. So thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want me to jump in? Please. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Oh, that didn't work. Um, sorry technological challenges. Okay, there we go. Now. Okay, there we go. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. That's great. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Rachel Fowler. I am the founder and creative director at Tonle, which is a zero waste um, ethical fashion business. Um, I actually graduated from college in 2008 um, with a degree in fiber from the Maryland Institute College of Art. So I am uh, lived in Baltimore for a while, got really into um, a lot of social justice work there. And I was also in my um, personal creative art making practice, making a lot of crafts, knitting, weaving, dyeing, but I couldn't see myself going into the fashion business because I knew that the fashion industry had a lot of exploitation in it um, and was basically built on a history of exploitation. Um, and so I avoided going into fashion, but I still couldn't get away from this love of making things. And I found that, you know, creating art and creating craft in my personal practice was very fulfilling and uplifting and joyful and in some ways a form of therapy and added all this value to my life. So I was trying to figure out, okay, how can I square this beautiful creative process brings to my life, but at the same time, the industry is so exploitative and extractive. Um, and I had an opportunity to visit Cambodia in 2007 with um, family friends. And I saw a lot of craftspeople who were making these beautiful traditional crafts and, you know, they were making a livelihood out of it. And I thought, okay, there, there must be a way to kind of merge these passions of social justice, um, and creating a more ethical vision of the fashion industry, um, with this joy and personal fulfillment that I know can come from a practice of making clothes. So I, applied for and was granted a Fulbright uh, fellowship to do research in Cambodia on traditional crafts um, and fair trade and sustainability. Um, Cambodia is a bit of a hotspot for fair trade or was at the time and continues to be because I think a lot of aid organizations had 
moved into the country after the um, country opened up in the early 90s um, and saw, you know, um, basically artisan businesses as a means to provide employment. Um, but in a lot of cases, they were essentially extensions of nonprofits or, you know, furthering kind of the aid and mission culture um, of uh, in, in Cambodia. So there was this kind of dichotomy between um, these fair trade businesses that were trying to provide employment, but not fundamentally tackling the larger systems that created a lot of those disparities in the first place. Um, and I think <clears throat> the aid industry in general can have a lot of those problems. And so fair trade um, wasn't providing a very good solution to that because it was also kind of continuing those same dynamics um, that essentially you know, were founded in colonialism and continue to this day. So you know, my first year in Cambodia was really, this is me in 2008. <laughs> My first year in Cambodia was really learning from traditional craftspeople, both making, the, actually making the products, learning how to weave and do all of these traditional techniques. Um, at the same time, I was getting to learn about their businesses and, you know, see what was working for them and not working for them. Um, and I was really lucky to have that learning experience because I think a lot of people go in, they, they see a problem and they immediately try to figure out how to solve it without fully like understanding the problem. Um, and so oh. for me, and that, I think, um, for me, that le for me, that leads to a lot of, you know, solutions that are not really addressing the root causes and are, are often not, um, you know, locally led and driven as well. Um, and so, you know, going through that year long process is really grateful to learn from all these different creators and makers. Um, and I also got to see a lot of the factories firsthand that were producing for large mass manufactured brands. Um, Cambodia was known as a hub for low cost manufacturing. It still is, although there are now countries where you can get even cheaper production. Um, but a lot of the lowest end fashion products were being produced in Cambodia. And so because of that, um, there was also a huge amount of waste. There was, um, you know, I, I think the economic recession that started in 2008, as I had just moved to Cambodia, um, really decimated the garment industry, but it also kind of led to the rise of fast fashion. So during the time I was living in Cambodia, the number of garments worldwide that were produced from 2008 to um, 2020 more than doubled yearly, um, which meant that garments were being produced faster, um, more cheaply with cheaper quality materials, and workers were being pushed um, harder than ever uh, to produce more and more, you know, garments um, with increasingly lower target times. And so I saw all that firsthand. And I saw also piles of waste that were piling up in the remnant markets um, where, you know, these were basically scraps that were being left over from the, these, these uh, increasingly fast production um, that was happening. So this was all kind of things I started to see the beginnings of in my first year. Um, here's some more um, traditional craft processes that I got to work on and um, learn from. And then, yeah, a picture of a, a factory in Cambodia to contrast um, the difference between sort of traditional production and, you know, um, methods of production that were much more, um, I, love the, <laughs> I love the image on the far left with the guy in the hammock in the background. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but methods of production that were much more, you know, um, harmonious with um, the earth and with the people who, you know, worked on them. That could be, you know, something you could do for your entire life and actually be, um, and, and actually gain not only a good job, but also, um, you know, personal fulfillment and joy in some way. Um, the um, weaving on the left is actually being done with uh, reeds that were basically from that weaver's backyard um, that grow abundantly in the marshes. So, you know, we've moved from, you know, in a span of 500 years or so, we've moved from the, the methods of production on the left to this. And, you know, it's an industry that essentially benefits a very, a very few people at the top. Well, most people struggle and um, in many cases are outright exploited. Um, Obviously, it disproportionately affects, the exploitation disproportionately affects women and BIPOC women more specifically. 
um, the countries where we manufacture most clothing it are um, historically colonized and continue to have um, the legacy of that colonialist um, mentality going on. So, you know, I was basically, okay, before we get to that, I was basically inspired to start um, a business with some of the people that I had met. And it wasn't my intention to stay in Cambodia and run that business. I originally wanted to basically work with a group of people who were expressing to me that they wanted to create a business. And I intended to basically help them start this business and then leave. Um, because I thought that was the most important thing that local leaders would be tackling these problems. Um, however, after about six months of working together with them, um, the first five women that I consider to be, you know, kind of co-founders in this business, um, they basically said to me, hey, um, you know, we really like doing this and we really believe in it, but we don't want to take on the risk that's associated with starting a small business, especially in the fashion industry. Once they had understood, you know, all of the risks and potential, you know, costs of actually starting a successful business that would pay fair wages and give good benefits, um, they were like, you know, we really want to just work in like a comfortable, safe environment with our friends and be able to go home at night and hang out with our kids and not have to worry about like the stresses of running a business. And I was like, yeah, that's actually makes a lot of sense. You know, like I think at the time there was this huge, this 2008, 2009, there was this huge um, kind of uh, wave of support for microfinance. And so there were a lot of people kind of coming in being like, we're gonna buy all these women's sewing machines and that means they're gonna know how to start a business and be able to sell to their community. But again, if you're not tackling the root causes of problems, um, which is, well, does do people in that community, can they afford to buy the products? Um, does that, per okay, if, if not, if there's not people in that immediate community that can afford to pay fair rates for these products, um, you know, does that person have access to a market where, where they can sell the products for a fair rate? Um, if, you know, if not, how do we create that access? Does that access require computer literacy, knowledge of a different language? You know, there were all these barriers, right? And I think, again, I keep going back to this legacy of colonialism because I think these countries, a lot of countries like Cambodia, for example, is a very resource rich country, but because of the history of war and colonialism, there's been a long period of extraction and without recognizing where those fundamental inequalities originated, we cannot come in and say, well, now we're just going to give you a business because you have to address how that, you know, how that deficit and how that extraction occurred and work to rectify those root problems. Um, so the more, the farther I get into my career, the more I think about how we need to work on systemic change because one business alone cannot solve these fundamental inequities. Um, one business alone that decides like, hey, we're gonna pay double the minimum wage um, cannot address like this 400 year legacy. Um, so I think there needs to be a systemic and, you know, um, collaborative approach to tackling these problems, but there needs to be a, a first an acknowledgement of where the problems originated. So fair trade um, was a concept that I had encountered, um, you know, in the beginning of running my business um, that I thought could be a really good solution. However, there can be some really problematic aspects of fair trade, um, particularly um, that first point, creating opp opportunities for economically disadvantaged producers. I think using this deficit language again doesn't acknowledge root problems and sometimes can cause people to focus on the wrong issues if we don't tackle the problems at their core then we create solutions that can reinforce white supremacy and hierarchy um so i think that fair trade is one potential solution to these problems but it needs to be looked at within a greater systemic lens um, I'm going to skip that. So this is my original team. Um, and we, you know, started first with a really small store in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So this is our first store. And um, some of the initial women that worked on the business. Um, and some of them are still working with me today, actually. Um, three of the people in this photo are still at Tome, which is something that I am really grateful for. Um, and we started making products using um, basically secondhand materials from like secondhand clothes, secondhand 
um, you know, textiles like bed sheets and so forth. And then that evolved into using, um, as we, as I got more into like going to these markets and finding these secondhand materials, I also discovered the problem with waste in the industry and how much waste is thrown out um, in the production process of these mass factories before even getting to the end consumer. Um, so this was our first collection. It's very like kind of DIY, handmade. Um, and, you know, we kind of evolved from that to this was the next collection. So we just kept, you know, I now would call this sort of rapid prototyping. Um, to use a really Silicon Valley buzzword, um, we, you know, each collection is an opportunity to learn what was working and what wasn't. And, you know, we would see what was working for customers and we would keep evolving with that. Um, so the two, the dress, these pieces, as you can see, they're all made from scrap fabrics. They're small pieces of fabric um, being reinvented in an interesting way. Um, this was our first store. Um, the brand was originally called Kyokuje, and we ended up going through a rebranding later and renamed as Tonline. Um, this is our next store. And um, so this has been just basically been the, this business over the last, you know, uh, 12 years, yeah, 12 years now has been just a continuous iteration and learning process. Um, you know, we have tried lots of things. And I think for me, like a big part of this has been just a, an effort of co-creation with my team in Cambodia, um, constantly listening and learning and seeing what is working for people and not. And the core of our business being our makers and our team, which is so opposite from the conventional fashion industry where most brands that you know of today are not actually clothing brands. They are marketing houses that just that just market products that factories make for them. So when the rubber hits the road, like at, you know at the beginning of this pandemic, um, you know all of these brands decided, hey, we're just not going to pay our factories for the products that they have already made. Um, and you know we have a situation going on now where about a quarter of Cambodia's garment factory workers have been laid off, um, some without back pay for products that they already worked on. Um, and being that this is the primary industry in the country, it's very hard on the community there. So, you know, at Tonle, you know, our makers are the most critical part of our business and we center them as the leaders and the champions in this industry. Um, and that's always been very core to what we do, which I like to highlight that we are first and foremost, basically a manufacturer and then secondly, a brand. Um, because I think that most brands, like most people don't understand that fundamentally, like brands don't make clothes. <laughs> um, and that's why they treat, they can treat their makers as disposable when it comes to a global pandemic, pandemic because the people who make their clothes are literally not even considered a part of their business. Um, which is very upsetting. So I think we need to really, yeah, I think again, going back to these like power dynamics, like why did brands get to have this position of power where the idea behind a piece of clothing is more valuable and the more important than the actual process of making a product. Um, because making a product is really hard. Making a garment, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, and we need to reevaluate what we value. Um, so anyway, these are, okay, so this goes a little into the waste materials that are used in our products. Um, I'm not going to go too into this because we have um, not much time. We, you know, we're kind of participating in the circular economy, this concept that, you know, um, things can be reused again and again. Um, we're working on the aspect of our business, which is collecting, you know, garments from the customers when they're done with them. So the end of life. Um, that's something we're working on in the future. Uh, I'm going to skip over this too. So yeah, here's some pictures of, let me see if I can show you the video here. This is a picture of one of the remnant. Um, I don't know if you could hear that um, sound, but basically these are scrap materials that are left over from a larger industry. So a lot of times they're really large bolts of fabric that are literally like perfectly good but they might have one hole in the middle or something so we can cut around it because we do like a more um 
a more, um, you know, hand cutting approach. And whereas these factories will just get rid of one, like huge amounts of fabric because, and another thing is the brands actually over order. Um, and then the factory, the factories will be like at the end of the season, they'll have a lot of leftover fabric because the brand didn't fulfill all the orders or something like that. There's a lot of reasons why this can end up, but it's this, essentially this disconnect between manufacturing and design that leads to all this waste. Um, so we're trying to, you know, come up with new ways of doing this. This is our workshop. Um, it's, um, sorry, can I ask if any, everyone can mute? Cause I'm hearing a lot of noise and it's really, it's hard for me to, um, it's hard for me to focus. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, so let me tell you one more thing. Yeah. So, sorry, so our workshop is set up more like, um, so we kind of see them as more like a sewing circle rather than an assembly line. Um, and people like face each other and they can talk and they can have dialogue as opposed to like a factory where people are sitting in long rows and they can't um, chat with each other and they can't have like that community. So the community aspect is really a key part of what we do. And it's a big part of what, um, you know, ma our makers really appreciate about Tone Lane. Um, and you can see on the right picture, you know, these are basically textiles that we have hand woven. Um, we take the scraps and we make them into yarn and then weave them into new products. Um, and yeah, this is the weaving center we work with. They're in northern, um, Pre in Prebihar province in Can Cambodia. And uh, you can see on the right, these are the basically textile scraps that get cut and turned into yarn and then woven into new fabrics. Oh, and there's another video <laughs> of the weaving center. Um, yeah, and these are some of our woven textiles. And um, we also make paper with the really small scraps that are left over as well. So that's how we get to a zero waste, um, fully zero waste model. And then these are some of our products. So you can see in this photo, these are some of the hand woven textiles that are own um, custom designs that we collaborate on with the weavers. And then we also make really comfortable, like basic, easy to wear stuff out of the, um, out of the larger scraps. Um, we do some patchwork designs, like any way that we can think of to use up small scraps, basically. And then this is our team today. Um, I think there's a few of their, yeah, there's a few kids in the photo of the, <laughs> of the employees. <laughs> They're not, the kids are not the employees. Um, but yeah, this is our team at a retreat in, um, in um, December. Uh, yeah, it was in January in Siem Reap. So like the pandemic was actually just starting and in China. So we were really lucky that we were able to actually do this because um, obviously things have changed really dramatically, but you can see um, our team has grown a lot and that's something that I'm really proud of that we have are able to employ um, now about 50 people um, full time in, in Cambodia. And, um, you know, we um, are really proud of that, that aspect and um, uh, we sell through retail, um, wholesale and e-commerce. Um, previously, a wholesale was a really big part of our business, and um, with the pandemic, that's really changed really dramatically. Um, so we're re really relying on online sales at the moment. Um, luckily, we've had a really great, and um, we've had a lot of great sales um, online, but our wholesale, which is basically selling to independent retailers, um, back in March, we lost about 100 orders, which is thousands of dollars of revenue that we'd already products that we'd already paid for. So it was, you know, we'd already paid people to make them and they were supposed to get shipped out. And basically people were canceling their orders or just saying, can you hold them and I'll take them later, which is also really hard because that means we're not getting paid. Um, so that's been really rough. Um, but I will say that with our message being, um, you know, our values are really core to what we do. And I think that we have integrity that a lot of brands don't have. And so while a lot of people are trying to get into like sustainability or social justice all of a sudden, or they feel like they need to all of a sudden get like a Black Lives Matter statement together um, when they haven't been doing that work for a long time, um, because we had integrity during this period. And for me, it was super important to pay our makers despite the fact that um, we were losing a lot of money. Um, I had to get really scrappy and 
consolidate all of our resources so that we can make sure everyone in Cambodia got paid. Um, we actually shut down our workshop for a month as well. And we had people working from home. So trying to like organize people working from home and also deal with like the fact that we were losing so many sales um, was pretty intense. Um, but I think because we kind of stuck true to our values and our principles, it gives us a lot more integrity to be able to take a, a stand on certain issues and um, be authentic with what we're doing. And a lot of brands at the moment are, I mean, I think that this is the future. I think that having that commitment to justice across every aspect of your business and making sure that the people who are most central to your business are taken care of um, during a crisis, it should be like the lowest bar of a business. <laughs> and yet this is what, you know, we're in right now where, um, and you know, we're seeing a lot of brands that aren't really being authentic are getting kind of called out in social media and stuff like that. So I think that um, for me, you know, it's been a really hard time during this pandemic, but um, I'm also encouraged that it's causing a lot of people to think about the structural injustices that have led us to this point, that this, these, these injustices have been going on for a long time and the pandemic is essentially exposing them and exposing and highlighting how bad these problems have gotten. Um, and that we need really, really big systemic approaches to tackling um, these problems. I think that a lot, a lot of people are kind of waking up to that for the very first time. And, you know, I do believe that Tome can be a model that can set a different standard for how things can be done. Um, this is a little bit about our environmental impact. Um, just, it's basically compared to um, the impact of producing conventionally. Um, this is the amount offset compared to the um, conventional, conventional equivalent um, by using recycled materials. And then I would say, um, yeah, these are just a couple of things that we're like on, you know, ongoing thinking about. Um, this slide is actually a little bit old, but I would say that these are all really spot on. Like, you know, we're just, I think we're struggling as if it's not struggling, but I think we're constantly grappling with the challenge between wanting to be very values aligned and authentic in every way, but also operating within a system that is super unethical. And so how do you market, even market your products when the way that everybody markets their products is very unethical. And, per, um, you know, um, I think scale versus ethics, you know, it's like on one level, if we grew and became really big, we would potentially have a bigger impact in some ways. But if we grew, that would also potentially, you know, force us to compromise our values in other ways because I think the system is fundamentally so like the capitalist system is so exploitative that you it's very hard to be a part of that system and participate in it but also not participate in it at the same time but I think we also need people to get in inside of it and make changes from the inside so that's kind of where I see my role being but I also have to acknowledge that there are going to be aspects of it that are going to be perfect and we need to be just com committed to continually continually improving. Um, you know, we can't, um, we just can't settle and say, hey, we're a sis I think the word sustainability should be a continuum. It's not a end goal. It's like, you have to keep on trying to be like, no business is sustainable. Um, because we are all contributing to the climate crisis to social injustices in some ways because of the system that we live in. But we can continue to get better and we can continue to move forward. And that's sort of my goal is just be transparent about the ways that we are not perfect, but we are working on it and improving. Um, so that's kind of where we're at today. And I started this little side project called Just Fashion, which I haven't done as much with as I'd like, but it's just a little bit of a platform for me writing about, you know, my, the industry and things that I need, things need to change in the industry. Um, and that's, that's what I've got for you. And I think with that, we could um, jump into a little Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Rachel. Um, if you'd like to ask Rachel a question, unmute yourself, probably in the lower left-hand corner. 
of your screen and jump in. Hey, Rachel. I'd like to just make a comment. Um, my name is Larry Kane. I live in New Hampshire. And uh, hi, Larry. Uh, hi. I I applaud what you're doing. Um, I love how you um, your values. You honor them. You trust them. You you work around them as a start point. Um, so um, I'm happy to be a bit of a supporter of your activity, and I'll have that opportunity, I'm sure, some more at the end of this. Um, you, you got a good backer in Elizabeth. Um, I got into Untours by going to Umbria and Tuscany on an Untours, and it was great. And then I found out about their foundation, and I applaud the way they work. Um, so anyway, and I even got a, I get some chocolate bars from her because <laughs> We paid Larry now. to say all this. We're, we're friends. <laughs> so anyway, outstanding story. Keep it up. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, we have a question down here in the chat from Mark. Um, I'm curious how you've seen the competitive landscape change around sustainable fashion since you founded this, even from large firms looking to jump in. And how you view your competitors, collaborators, a mindset of big companies jumping in can serve to lift all boats? Yes. That's a really good question, something I've struggled with a lot. Um, you know, I think there's one part of me that wants to say that the growing awareness around sustainable fashion. Okay, I want to, let me talk about pre-pandemic and let me talk about post-pandemic. Um, so pre-pandemic, I was getting increasingly frustrated with large companies who were coming into the space and kind of talking about sustainability or ethical fashion, but not in a very authentic way. And because a lot of them, especially some of the D2C brands, um, sorry, yeah, direct-to-consumer brands that were essentially venture funded and kind of crowding the landscape with you know, like essentially taking up space and opportunities from people who are doing it really authentically, that it was actually in many ways taking away from our business and also con confusing consumers, um, you know, confusing consumers about what sustainability means and um, potentially, you know, and I think it becomes really problematic where if you're a large venture funded company that is backed by, let's say, um, you know, someone like Amazon or like your ultimate goal is, to, is essentially IPO or sell to a much larger company that's going to eventually force you to, to compromise your values if you're not already compromising your values. So if those companies can essentially run advertising at unprofitable rates just so they can grow and beat out their competitors, like their goal is to squash the companies that are doing things better than they are, right? And to make sure that our voices aren't heard when we're being critical um, they can use, you know, they can run ads on platforms at unprofitable rates because they're venture funded. And so for me, that's really problematic because, you know, like an H and M got called out for this a bunch of times because they were, um, and H and M is actually not a great example because only about like they had, I think about five percent of their business was like their so-called conscious line, um, but they were funding all of these sustainable fashion platforms you know, they were backing a whole bunch of these like nonprofit organizations. They're essentially paying people off so they wouldn't say bad, bad things about H&M. So that I think is really problematic. It confuses customers, it muddies the waters, it waters down like the words. Um, and then I think another, like other two other good examples are Reformation and um, Everlane who both were, again, I mean, sorry to say, but venture funded and very heavily invested in creating a good image of themselves, not in their actual sustainability efforts. So they're also kind of crowding out the space and crowding out the market for the people who are really doing it well. So we saw like, for example, over the last five years, our organic engagement across all the platforms, including Google and um, you know Facebook, Instagram, all the social media platforms, our organic engagement went down because in the past, when we were one of the earliest sustainable brands out there, people could find us. But as soon as these platforms started to heavily monetize um, search and, you know, social media, you know, search and uh, Google search, when monetizing that became more important than providing good information, um, 
then you have an opportunity for brands who aren't really doing what they're saying, like who really aren't being 100% true and authentic to actually get their voices sort of pushed to the top. Now, on the other hand, I think, so there's, that's one side. The other side, I think, is, is could we see the opportunity to collaborate with brands who are truly doing things in the right way as a rising tide lifts all boats mindset? And I, that I'm 100% for. Um, and this is where we started talking at the beginning of this conversation um, about um, uh, Kimberly and her business, Grant, um, Grant Boulevard, which I think is a very synerg synergistic, amazing brand that is in many ways has a lot of overlap with Tomei. With a brand like that, who I 100% believe in what they're doing, and it's different in some ways, but also complementary. To me, I don't see them as competition. I see them as a potential collaborator where I'm like, okay, there is more than enough room in this market for those of us who are trying to do the things in the right way to work together and promote each other. And that I think is absolutely necessary because otherwise there's no way for us to get our voices out there. Like we are just too small. And to be frank, I'm not going to invest the money to push my product in that way because it's not ethical. Like I would not invest my money in massive Facebook campaigns or Google campaigns. So fundamentally, like I can never outcompete Everlane on, you know, marketing, but I can outcompete Everlane on authenticity. <laughs> and that's where I think like this integrity component comes into play. Because if you look them up, like both Everlane and Reformation are getting called out right now on being racially um, uh, having racist company cu culture. Uh, so for me, it's kind of like, can we find the other people who are really doing things right and collaborate with them and co-create with them, but at the same time, not selling our soul to um, these unjust methods of promotion. Okay, and I see another comment here. Um, have you considered making masks? Seems like it would be a natural fit at this time. Um, yes, we did. Uh, we have been doing mask making. We actually did a big campaign with um, uh, Etsy where we produced a bunch of masks, a large order of masks to that they actually donated to the USPS, which was pretty cool. So basically Etsy paying for that. And, um, you know, I that was very grateful for that because it kind of got us through the month of April, like that those orders got us through the month of April. And then we also have been producing small wholesale orders of masks for people. Um, and we have them selling on our website as well as a direct, like direct to consumer. So yes. Um, next comment is from Samantha. Um, just read a wonderful book called Journey of a T-shirt in the global economy that really opened my eyes to the power that every consumer has to choose ethical fashion, vote with their wallets and perhaps, or, and reshape the fashion industry. I'm curious to hear how you've seen consumer attitudes towards ethical fashion change in your 12 years of business. Um, so I think that consumer attitudes definitely have changed. I think people are looking for ethical fashion and sustainable fashion, but I think that unfortunately, because there's so much misinformation out there and ultimately the brands are controlling the narrative um, that, and the brands are paying for PR to talk about how they're doing all these good things. but my biggest issue is that the factories are actually the ones doing the sustainability work and they rarely get credit and we rarely hear from them. So I think there's a lot of misinformation about who's really doing what and how you actually find an ethically made product. Um, and, you know, so I, I do have concerns about this, like, um, message that consumer pressure is enough. I think, for me, it's really important to me personally to shop in a way that aligns with my values, but I feel like that's just one part. It's, it's for me, like that putting the pressure on the larger industry needs to happen actually in politics, in voting for politicians who are going to regulate this industry, in um, internal pressure within companies, employees working within a company culture to actually change from the inside. Um, I think there needs to be, yeah, I think regulation is a big part of it. I think um, labor, 
rights organizations that are actually led by people in the places where this, these injustices are happening. I think there's like a lot of different parts of it that need to come together. And for me, um, systems change is, is more important than individual conscious consumerism. I think conscious consumerism is not enough by itself, but I do think that conscious consumerism leads you to think about the bigger systemic problems. And so in and of the fact that it leads me to consciously evaluate these systems and think about these systems, that is, um, where the real change is going to happen. But like when you change your behavior, you start to have more awareness. So like it's kind of, you have to retrain yourself so that you're constantly thinking about those things. So for example, like factories. So, you know, when you go into a clothing store and there's a, a certain smell, right. in that clothing store that is basically chemicals that get sprayed on the garments at the garment factories, including formaldehyde and lots of other bad chemicals that are really toxic for the workers and slightly toxic for the people wearing the clothes. Um, and um, when I saw that in factories myself and I smelled that smell in a factory, that permanently changed the way that I felt when I even walk by a clothing store and I smell that smell wafting out of the door I immediately viscerally experienced that factory and I experienced the injustice happening in that factory. But most people, when they smell that smell, they, they, they think new clothes, like shopping, like it's, it's a psychological thing. Right. And you have to, I think we can train our brains to, to, to rethink that. But I think when you start to retrain your brain on how you purchase personally, it gets you to hopefully, that point where you're willing to fight against those injustices in every aspect, not just in, oh, I can occasionally buy like a, you know, an organic cotton t-shirt and I feel better about myself. It needs to be like, this needs to be embedded into how I think about these systems in every way. So I think it's a both, it's a both and situation. Um, okay, so this is easy. What is your website? Do you sell product on it? Yes. Um, it's tonely.com, T-O-N-L-E.com. And yes, we sell product on our website. Um, okay, who are your allies and how are you successfully finding your audience? Um, so because our business has been going for a while, it's, I think, building community and interacting with people in like an authentic and organic way. And that has changed like as the platform has, as different platforms come and go. Um, you know, our first iteration. So yeah, anyway, building community and organically, authentically engaging with people is the most important part. I haven't really found like many paid campaigns that actually work well for us because again, like I just don't think we can compete in that space well. Um, so, you know, I think um, it's been an evolution. You know, first we started really collecting email addresses from people who came to visit our store in Phnom Penh and then that email, and so it would be visitors and travelers who are coming through, we started collecting those emails and, you know, um, started growing a Facebook page in that time when we were still just operating out of Cambodia. I was only selling through the stores in Cambodia, but we started, you know, gathering those contacts and engaging with people through our email list. And then when we were, and that just kind of grew and grew like word of mouth, right? And then when we launched our Kickstarter campaign in 2014, we already had an audience of people who were like excited to buy our products, who were like, oh, I've been following this brand for, you know, three or four years and I saw them when I was in the store in Cambodia and now I can finally get their t-shirt or whatever it was. And, you know, that's kind of been our best, you know, that's been like the most successful thing is just to find the people who really uh, care about what you do and really deeply try to engage with those people because our customers are our best form of marketing. I mean, a lot of brands will say that, but our method has been mostly to just try to find the people who are already really into what we do and let them be our champions. Um, and that's worked. I mean, you can't grow a brand really fast that way, <laughs> but you can grow, you know, you can grow like again, authentically and, in a values aligned way. And then, you know, for me, it's been like a sacrifice of like scale, but also like keeping that 
keeping that core group of people who really get what you're doing and really value what you're doing. And as we've evolved and we've changed our thinking on things, we've also educated our customers as we've been growing and we've been, and, and we've been learning, we share about that process and we say, you know, these are the things that we're thinking about and evaluating and reevaluating. And so our customers have been able to kind of come along with us on that learning journey, which has been great. <laughs> um, so I have customers, you know, on our email list who've been following us for 10 years. Um, and that's beautiful. So, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, another question here. I see some beautiful home goods on your website. What motivated you to move in this direction? How do you see yourself and the movement in that space? Will you be doing more homewares? Um, yeah. So I think homewares, um, speaking of fashion, um, homewares is a big category this year. Everyone who sells homewares has said that homewares are doing really well because I think people are obviously stuck at home. They're thinking about their space and what they want to see in their space. And um, I think there's been a re-emphasis on, and, and I think with that comes like an interest in quality of how the product was made. Um, if you're going to stare at something that's sitting, you know, every single day that's on your couch, um, you might start thinking about like, how was this made and, <laughs> you know, who made it and so forth. So I do think the homewares category is going to be really strong this year. And, um, we are actually working on some more homewares products that we plan to release in, um, about a month. So yeah, that will be, um, and the other reason why we're doing more homewares is because, um, so we work with this weaving group and we do these hand woven, um, kind of jackets and tops made out of these woven materials and they're haven't sold as well um this year because they're a bit higher end and people are wanting like comfy basics that they can wear um in, at home and so our, our category our like more basics category like has sold really well but our hand woven items um haven't sold as well but again because our designs are kind of tar you know designed around our production capacity as opposed to the other way around. Um, I really needed to find things that the weavers could do. So we thought, and the, the textiles really lend themselves well to home goods as well. And we've been wanting to do that for a while. So I kind of thought, okay, well, now we have some extra time. The weavers have some extra time because we're not doing as much of these hand woven jackets. So let's, you know, do some more homework so they can also create, um, yeah, so that, that we have a product. And home, because homewares are a popular category at the moment, um, you know, it's a good, it's a great thing to have the weavers work on. So those are kind of dual motivations for that. Yeah. You share the story of your solar panels. Oh, uh, well, and what happened and what didn't happen. Oh gosh. So yeah. Just as an example um, of how hard it is to do this. This is classic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we, um, gosh, uh, so last year, Cambodia was facing um, power outages um, due to um, Phnom Penh specifically, the capital where we have our sewing workshop, was facing um, power outages across the city for days at a time. Um, depending on how wealthy your neighborhood was, you might have a two-hour power outage or you might have an eight-hour power outage. Um, our workshop is not in a wealthy neighborhood, so we were having a whole day long power outages for weeks at a time. And, um, you know, this was the, and this was during the hot season where it's about like 95 degrees Fahrenheit and humid and, you know, working, having people come to work in a workshop with no fans, no sewing machines was kind of not an option. <laughs> um, and so we tried to, we decided we wanted to, we had been wanting to actually solarize our workshop for a while, but there's complicated issues with that too in Cambodia because basically the government has actually stopped a lot of factories from installing solar panels because they don't get money when people have solar panels because the government is running the electric company. So they weren't wanting people to invest in solar. So they were like, stopped a lot of people from investing in solar and then when the power crisis hit and they didn't actually have enough power all these factories actually started burning 
um, well, they, they were already doing this, but they burn wood and textile waste to power their factories in really unclean ways. So it's sort of like all kind of a nightmare. So we decided we wanted to get solar panels so that we could have power and we could also like use it as an opportunity. Okay, we can turn lemons into lemonade. Lemons into lemonade, yes. And we got a quote from a company and they said it's gonna be about like $10,000 to get solar panels that will make enough power for your workshop. Great. So we went out and applied. We actually ran a public lending campaign, which was um, basically people could donate small, like could not donate, but put in small amounts. Lenders could basically lend small amounts and contribute to our, our loan fund, but we had to repay this loan for the solar panels. So um, we raised the money and we got the solar panels and they did not work. <laughs> so we were getting like one hour of power a day maybe from these solar panels that were supposed to generate, um, you know, that were supposed to generate eight hours of power to cover our sufficient. And then the company, which was Dutch, run by a Dutch person, um, men, I should say, two men, um, <laughs> were basically really like demeaning about the situation. And they kept telling us that we were doing things wrong, which we weren't. And it even kind of came to a point where they were saying like low key, like racist, thing. like they were treating my, my team in Cambodia in a very demeaning way. Like you don't understand, you know, and you know, kind of talking down to them, like, and basically the company scammed us, like they, we we still have and and so i ended up going into like a big negotiation with them and i tried to get them to pay us like to take the the panels and the batteries away and they origin eventually agreed to give us our money back but then they never did <laughs> so i still have this not working solar system and not working battery system in my workshop and it's just like, it's such a classic example of like things that basically you can get away with in Cambodia. And this is like, this is what drives me crazy about the aid industry and uh, a lot of nonprofit organizations. And it's like, they can get away with these things in Cambodia and nobody is going to call them out a lot. And they're like, legally nothing we can do, even though it's so wrong. Like they literally defrauded us and I can't do anything. I'm just like $15,000 down the drain. And not only that, but we had to pay the loan back. So we had to pay the loan out of money that we were making from other ways um, because the, the, the loan prices were based on the fact that we were gonna get this offset on our power bills, which we didn't get, of course. So that was that story. <laughs> There's one more question in the dialogue box and then we'll close. Okay. Um, can you say more about your design process? Cheers for your cradle to cradle value. Yes. Um, we're not quite cradle to cradle yet. I'd like to be there. Um, but yes, yeah, so I kind of skipped over the zero waste slides in our webs on our on our deck, but there's a little more on, on our website about this. But um basically we take this waste material that comes from so first of all, I would I would like to say that the way that most design companies work is they um design entirely, they so totally separate from manufacturing. They have a team of designers who looks at numbers and forecasts and, you, you know, like previous sales reports and trends and a, a number of other things. And they sort of design around what they think is going to be the best fit for the market. Um, then they have a separate team that goes and finds manufacturing partners who can make these things. And then you end up with kind of complex, convoluted supply chains of have your products made all over the world. And then they get to the customer and you know you have a t-shirt that says made in Cambodia but it could actually have components from like 10 different countries um so you know this is how you end up with like a very big disconnect between and this is why I say like the, the disconnect between design and manufacturing is what leads to a lot of the environmental social and environmental problems um so what we do that's very different is our manufacturing is the central is the first thing that we look at when we decide if we're going to just when we're going to design a collection so we say like this is the capacity of our team these are the skill sets we have then we go and we find fabrics in the market so it's like these kind of the market pictures i showed you 
and it's basically piles and piles of all the fabrics that are left over from previous, you know, from these other factories. We go and we look at what's available and we say, hey, these colors are kind of going together and we might have like a color scheme that we've already set out and we kind of look for colors that go along with that, but that's going to be like the biggest part that we do before we actually go source fabric. And then a lot of times we'll find things in the market that we're like, oh, this is so not what I was expecting to find, but it's really cool. So let's like incorporate this into the process. Um, and the other thing we think about is every season we will have certain kinds of scraps left over from the previous season. So we try to reincorporate, you know, we'll figure out, oh, we have still like this leftover waste material from last season. So let's like pull that over. And then we need to design around, you know, tying that together with the colors of the new collection. Um, so one of my retailers said she really likes it because from one season to the next, they kind of like flow into each other. Um, and when she gets a new collection of Tonle, it still sits really nicely on the shelf with the other items from the previous season. So it doesn't have to be so like, oh, we have to discount all this season now because it doesn't look good on the rack with these other ones. <laughs> um, which is kind of how like traditional fashion works. Um, so then we, you know, design the basic shapes and we have like the techniques that we kind of use consistently from one collection to another, like the patchwork, the hand weaving. Um, and we'll design like with a combination of that knowledge of like the techniques we want to use, the, um, um, you know, the fabrics we have. And then we go back and we look at our sales reports and we say, okay, what worked well last season? Let's kind of like design more, you know, around that with, um, you know, with the fabrics and the materials we have. And then as that goes into production, we then the designer, so we have a designer who works in Cambodia. Her name is also Rachel, confusingly. She's American. She's the one American member of our team in, in Phnom Penh. And she will, um, you know, work with the production team as they're making the sample to see like, oh, this particular construction is kind of hard for production. So let's tweak it and make it a little bit more streamlined with the production processes that we have. So the production also comes into play there where we're like, we're designing around how to make things uh, optimal with our production process as well. Um, and we have and to then, wrap this up, Rachel. That's it. <laughs> that's it, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, if you order from Tone Lay, Rachel has mastered minimalist packaging and it's really beautiful. I love when the packages come and, and how you do it. So Thank I want you. you all for coming. I see that Bob Miller is here, our favorite centarian. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to you all for the love and support you give to the Untours Foundation, to Untours, to Tone Lay. Thank you all for this hour uh, and especially Rachel. So hope thank you so much. And I want to give time. another plug to the Untours Foundation <laughs> and everything you're doing. I think it's just so like it is the vision that we need for um, you are just setting such a great standard for impact investing that I think um, everyone would be good to, you know, follow because it is taking it to a whole new level that I think is, is really the direction that we need, that we need to see in the world. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for letting us ride your coattails, Rachel. You're zero away. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> so thank you thank all. You for your support. Great to thank see you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm.